We've seen how we can represent tastes or preferences graphically using indifference curves. And in fact, a complete representation of someone's tastes is not just one or two indifference curves, it's a whole map of indifference curves. Next, we're going to ask the question, how can we represent those same tastes mathematically? And for that, we're going to turn to utility functions. But before we talk about utility functions, let me remind you what functions actually are. Functions are simply rules that assign numbers to points. Those points might lie in a single dimensional space on the real number line. Those points might lie in a plane and have two dimensions to them. Or those points might come from a much more complicated space. They might come from a space where there are n different dimensions. Functions can assign numbers to points regardless of what space they come from. So in the simplest case, we might have points that lie on the real number line. And we're going to assign numbers to those points on a vertical axis. And we're going to denote that axis f of x. So such a function can take many different forms, but one form would be something like x squared. So that would give us the rule that we use to assign numbers to these points. We could take the point 1, plug that number in for x, 1 squared is just 1, so that point would be assigned the number 1. We could take the point 2, plug 2 in here, 2 squared is equal to 4, and so that would tell us that we're assigning the number 4 to this point. Or we could take the point 3, plug 3 in, 3 squared is 9, so we would assign the number 9 to this point. And we can do that for every point on the x-axis to trace out what that function will look like. So in this case, we have a function that maps points that lie in one-dimensional space, in fact in the positive part of that one-dimensional space, into numbers that also lie in the one-dimensional space. So that's the simplest kind of function we could think of. But what if we have points that lie in two-dimensional space? Well, then we would use a rule, a function, that assigns two points that lie in two-dimensional space, maybe in the positive part of that two-dimensional space, numbers that still lie on the real number line. Only now we have points that are more complicated, points that have an x1 dimension and an x2 dimension. So, points that lie in this plane. When we use a function to assign numbers to these points, we again need a vertical dimension, just like we had a vertical dimension here, to indicate what numbers are assigned to these points. So we can put in this vertical dimension, and on that axis, we're going to indicate what the rule f tells us should be the number that's assigned to different points that have two components. So for every x1 and x2 component in here, that function assigns a number. And of course, you could do the same thing with a more complicated space. You could have a function that takes points that have n different components, that lie in n dimensions that we can't graph, and still assign numbers on the real number line to those points. Now, when we're talking about goods, x1 might be apples, x2 might be oranges, and each of these points is a bundle, a basket of goods, oranges and apples. And we could use a rule like this to assign what level of happiness or what level of utility you get from each of these consumption bundles. In that case, the rule, the function, would be a utility function. Only now we wouldn't use f, but to indicate that it's a utility function, we'd use u to represent the function. So we would write the function as the utility of x1 and x2, the utility of that basket of goods.
Now it's hard to picture what these functions look like when they are when they are functions that assign numbers to points that lie in the plane because that function lies in three-dimensional space. So what I've done is created a little animation that shows you what a utility function might look like and that then illustrates how that utility function relates to these indifference maps that we've been graphing. So let's take a look at that. We'll call our two goods x1 and x2 and bundles of x1 and x2 therefore lie in a plane. We'll measure the utility or the happiness of each bundle along a third axis and we'll trace out the function ux1x2 as a utility mountain that assigns to each one of the bundles in the plane a height which represents the level of happiness we attain at that bundle. We can perhaps get an even better idea of what this utility function looks like by rotating it around and showing it to be a hollow mountain that has no peak. It has no peak because more is better and so the more I stuff into your bundle, the higher a number the utility function will assign to that bundle. The height of our mountain is the level of happiness that's assigned by the utility function. And so if more is better, the mountain will never have a peak. If we now want to find all the bundles that give us utility level 2, we simply go to the height 2 and take a horizontal slice of this utility function. We can similarly ask what are all the bundles that give us utility level 4 or utility level 6 and take a similar horizontal slice of the function. The utility function we're using, by the way, is the function x1 to the one-half, x2 to the one-half, sometimes known as the Cobb-Douglas utility function with weights one-half for each of the goods. If we now strip away the function and leave only the portions that intersected with the slices we've taken at utility levels 2, 4, and 6, we get a picture that looks like three indifference curves floating in the air. After a while, these indifference curves might get tired of floating around in the air, and so we can transfer them into the x1, x2 plane by first redrawing that plane and then bringing down each one of the three curves. We can furthermore indicate which of the curves attains what utility level by simply transferring the number of the utility level at which we took the horizontal slice in panel A of the graph. We can then straighten out our x1, x2 plane to get our usual graph of indifference curves. We can then think of indifference curves as slices of utility mountains, where those mountains can be represented mathematically as utility functions. The number next to an indifference curve then indicates the height at which that indifference curve happens on the mountain. Of course, that height depends on the ruler that we use to measure utility. And as we use different rulers to measure utility, that number is going to change. The shapes of the indifference curves themselves, however, should be unaffected by what ruler we use to measure happiness. If two bundles make me equally happy, it doesn't matter how I measure happiness, they'll still make me equally happy.